Welcome back, everyone. I am Michael, your host for Antediluvian Revelations, a poetic retelling of the book of Enoch, the prophet. This is the fourth segment of the revised summary discussion of part two. The second example of ancient editorialization. Melchizedek does not appear in the Quran. However, Islamic scholars have also identified Melchizedek as a priest who blessed Abraham because Islam also has components of its theology that originated in the same ancient text that became the Old Testament. The fragments of scrolls found in the Qumran caves are evidences of the copying and altering activities perpetrated by heretics prior to and during the lifetime of Jesus Christ, who lived briefly during the Second Temple period. The rise of Islam also occurred several hundred years after the Torah had become tainted by heretics who altered the text during the Second Temple period. The matter of Melchizedek blessing Abraham appears in the editorialized Torah because Melchizedek proclaimed Abram the victor in what had become a brutal conflict. However, there was no ritualistic blessing of Abraham with wine and bread by an ordained priest of God Most High. Just because heretics and their fraudulent documents say it was so does not make it the truth. Melchizedek was not a priest of God Most High. But this mistaken moniker was given to him in the English translation of the canonized Holy Bible and the Genesis Apocryphon because he had negotiated a peace by proclaiming that Abram's God had given him the victory. Melchizedek was the name of the king of Salem during the time of Abram, but he was not an ordained priest or rabbinical authority for the God of Abram. The only truthful claim about Melchizedek is that he was the king of Salem and a peacemaker in the time of Abram. The king of Salem would not have been a rabbi of the theology associated with Abram because Abram was the father of Judaism, a faith in the singular entity, the everlasting almighty God, Yahweh. The authority for the ordination of any person to be a priest of God most high in the time of Abram would have only been Abram, but that would only have been the case several years after the Siddim Valley conflict when God called Abram to be the prophet Abraham, which would have enabled Abraham to ordain any person as a priest of the Most High God. In the historical retelling of the event within the Mosaic text, the king of Salem was honored with the title translated as priest, but the original word could have been a synonym for peacemaker because he had prevented further bloodshed between Abram and the king of Sodom. Melchizedek is more correctly defined as the king of peace because of this event, and he was never an officially ordained priest of God Most High. Melchizedek's appearance in the history of Abram has validity in the text of the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, a comparison of the details proves that the specific detail of wine and bread did not appear in the Qumran skulls. Food and drink are general terms and not precisely equivalent to wine and bread, which are specific terms. By comparison, a statement about fruit does not specifically mean that the fruit is an apple. The fruit of the forbidden tree was not an apple. Additionally, the canonized Genesis text excludes any details about Abram's army receiving any food and drink which is clearly an important detail necessary for accurately understanding the circumstances. Abram was not by himself receiving a blessing from a priest in a ritual involving bread and wine. Abram was with his army and received food and drink from the king of Salem who came to talk terms of peace as a pacifist. The details appearing in the ancient scrolls differ from those appearing in the canonized text and these differences are the evidences of how heretics altered and editorialized the text of the Torah to exclude some details, inject fraudulent information, and manipulate the linguistics of the translations for the purpose of supporting an alternate theological premise. The alterations appearing in the ancient Eastern text of the Holy Bible as translated by George Lamsa has the purpose of supporting the inclusion of consuming bread and wine as a ritualistic blessing in the New Testament theology that became known as Catholicism. 
The simple modifications by changing words and manipulating grammar enable the inclusion of a pagan ritual in Christian dogma. And revealing this truth becomes the evidence of how false prophets and heretics have misled people into accepting paganistic fabrications and heretical embellishments. Expanding on the identity and ideology of a fraudulent Melchizedekian persona in biblical texts. The third example of ancient editorialization. There is a second entity with the name of Melchizedek appearing in the Qumran cave scroll fragments and he was not the king of Salem. The use of the name Melchizedek was not exclusive to being the name of the king of Salem. And there is an even deeper history and theology associated with the persona of Melchizedek that does not appear explicitly explained in the Torah. The only vaguely associated reference to this alternate Melchizedek entity in the canonized Holy Bible is in Psalm 110 verse 4, which says, quote, The Lord has sworn and will not lie. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. As previously stated in the text of this book, psycholinguistic manipulations are the intentional creation of errors in punctuation, grammar, and word choice that have the purpose of causing confusion or a misunderstanding as a curse or spell. The use of the required bracketed notations in the quote are indications of errors that have the requirement to be identified in scholarly writings like this one. Psycholinguistic manipulations are editorialized curses designed by pagans and heretics of ancient times who had the goal of tricking the reader or listener into having a misguided understanding of the textual meaning. Unraveling these curses by analyzing the linguistic clues has become the proof of how the text of the Holy Bible has been cursed with fraudulent editorialization. David's psalm writing technique maintains specific characteristics that become a repeated pattern in the majority of the psalms. Identifying these characteristics and the pattern will provide evidence to support the author's claim that David did not write Psalm 110, as it appears in the English translations from the 4th century AD Aramaic Peshitta manuscripts, nor in the King James Version, KJV, or the New International Version, NIV. The first point of consideration about the psalms in general is to understand that they are songs of praise devotional prayers, and prophecies. As the divinely chosen and prophetically appointed king of Israel, David was not a king by virtue of conquest. He was a boy who defeated a superior opponent in a fight using a single stone and a sling. He was a simple shepherd boy who preferred the peaceful life of being a shepherd, playing a musical instrument and singing poems that expressed his faith in God. The most important characteristic of David's psalms is that they nearly all contain some verse that gives praise to God. Psalm 110 does not have this characteristic. Discussing the examination of Psalms 109 and 111 will prove the identification of the characteristic of praise to be valid. Psalm 109 verse 1 says, quote, Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise. End quote. And Psalm 111 verse 1 says, Quote, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. End quote. The first verse of Psalm 110 says, quote, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. End quote. There may not be any need to explain how this first verse of Psalm 110 is different from the first verse of Psalms 109 and 111. However, there is a need to identify this first verse as being a curse rather than a praise or blessing. The purpose of Psalm 110 becomes revealed in this analysis as being a prophecy empowered with a curse, which may be argued as another characteristic of many psalms. One of David's psalm writing techniques was to embed both curses and blessings within his prophecies and songs. This pattern may be found in Psalm 109, verse 28, which states, Let them be cursed, but thou shalt be blessed, and let thou servant rejoice. Another example of these dichotomous components appears in Psalm 107, verses 33 through 36, which says, He turns rivers into wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground. 
He turns the wilderness into pools of water and dry land into water springs. The pattern for these dichotomies may appear in a single verse, or it may appear extended over several verses. Because David was anointed with God's Holy Spirit, his prophecies followed a consistent pattern of content, and they contain a dichotomy of blessings and curses. While it might seem there is a blessing in the verse, quote, Thy people shall be glorious in the day of thy power, arrayed in the beauty of holiness. From the womb I have begotten thee as a child from the ages. End quote. That's Psalm 110 verse 3. The verse is actually a psycholinguistic manipulation, referring to the origin of Melchizedek. According to the heretical mythology appearing in 2 Enoch, Melchizedek was born from the body of a dead woman who had become inexplicably pregnant during menopause. Thus he was birthed as a child from the ages. This verse is not a blessing, but it is most definitely part of the Melchizedekian curse, created by ancient editorialization and most likely fraudulently attributed to being the work of David. In the absence of any other reference to the origin of Melchizedek within the text of the Torah, Talmud, or the New Testament, the obvious conclusion is that the heretic who created two Enoch used Psalm 110 verse 4 as evidence from the Torah to substantiate an origin story for the fraudulent Melchizedek entity appearing in this psalm and in the epistle to the Hebrews. In the absence of any other reference to the origin of Melchizedek within the text of the Torah, Talmud, or the New Testament, the obvious conclusion is that the heretic who created to Enoch used Psalm 110 as evidence from the Torah to substantiate an origin story for the fraudulent Melchizedek entity appearing in this psalm and in the epistle to the Hebrews. Despite the date attributed to the Slavonic translation's origin to be approximately the 7th century AD, there is the matter of identifying the text from which that translation was created. Scholars claim the Slavonic translation originated from a Greek text that no longer exists. The scholars who make this claim are not scholars at all, because they have no archaeological evidence to substantiate their claim. True scholars do not simply make conclusive statements without substantiating evidence. Well, it has been shown in the introduction of this book that the Ethiopic text contains characteristics of a Greek poetry writing style, there is no archaeological evidence to substantiate the existence of a Greek original of the Book of Enoch. In the absence of evidence to prove it existed, the only scholarly claim is to say that a Greek original of the Book of Enoch did not exist. As already stated in this book, the scribe who wrote the text of the Book of Enoch that does exist as archaeological evidence in Ethiopic was at least classically educated in Greek and imitated Greek poetry writing style in the creation of the Ethiopic version of the Book of Enoch, which is properly known as One Enoch, the first and foremost authoritative manuscript in Ethiopic ancient Hebrew. Two Enoch is a fraud. The curse of Melchizedek is not the result of the inclusion of this name in Genesis for the king of Salem who performed the function of peacemaker and was later named a priest of the Most High God in recognition of his heroic action. The Melchizedekian curse is the fraudulent inclusion of this persona in Psalm 110 that becomes a quote falsely attributed to Jesus Christ in the plagiarized testimonies of the Synoptic Gospels and in the text of the epistle to the Hebrews. The curse within Psalm 110 is the basis for the argument appearing in the epistle to the Hebrews authored by someone whose true identity is still not known more than 1800 years after the inclusion of the text in the canonized New Testament. The Slavonic to Enoch, which is the only text containing the origin of Melchizedek beyond the reference in Psalm 110, is not substantiated in translations of the book of Enoch fragments found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is no mention of Melchizedek in the book of Noah or the book of giants that scholars have identified among the Dead Sea Scrolls. While the Dead Sea Scroll version of the book of Enoch exists only as fragments, there are two preserved copies of the book of Enoch written in Ethiopic, which is a language that predates Slavonic by several thousand years. 
A third copy in Ethiopic may exist as property among the ancient estate of James Bruce, but there is no record of anyone translating Bruce's copy the same as there exists for the copy at Oxford's Bodleian Library and the comparative study of the text in the Paris Library. The story of Melchizedek's origin does not appear in the 1883 edition of the English translation of the Ethiopic manuscripts discovered in 1773, nor in the fragments among the Dead Sea Scrolls, which clearly proves that the Slavonic version is a fraud. To Enoch is a fraud created in medieval times by Bulgarian heretics. The heretical and fraudulent Slavonic translation of the Book of Enoch has been the cause of rejection for the Ethiopic Book of Enoch in Christian dogma because of the fraudulent origin of Melchizedek presented in two Enoch. But one Enoch was the text that Jesus Christ and his disciples knew because it has been validated by translations of the Dead Sea Scroll fragments that date back to just before the time of Christ. Jesus Christ and his disciples would have known the Book of Enoch in Ethiopic because the language was an ancient form of Hebrew. A Greek original of the Book of Enoch never existed. The Book of Enoch was not hidden away in an Egyptian pyramid as hieroglyphics either, because the Book of Enoch was still only known to his descendants by memorization resulting from oral recitation and teaching from one generation to the next after the time of Noah. The written version of the Book of Enoch was not created until writing on papyrus became possible around the time of Moses. So one Enoch has not been involved as a component of the Melchizedekian curse. A true descendant of Noah was most likely the scribe who created the Ethiopic text of one Enoch, but he was most likely educated in classical Greek. The next component of the Melchizedekian curse appears in Psalm 110 verse 4 and it contains another example of psycholinguistic manipulation concealed in the use of the word sworn, which can have a positive or negative meaning. In the positive sense, sworn could mean that a promise has been made. In the negative sense, sworn could be a reference to an execration or a curse. While swear and curse may have the same meaning depending on the context, there is clearly a negative connotation to the word if it refers to an execration. One of the effects of psycholinguistic manipulation is to cause confusion by using words that have multiple meanings in a manner that conceals the true meaning of the word, which can be the opposite of what it might appear to mean in the context. The word sworn becomes a subliminal suggestion by virtue of its potential to have two meanings in the text. Another consistent characteristic of David's writing style was the repetition of certain words or phrases. These repetitions can be either for the purpose of blessing or cursing as previously demonstrated to be one of David's patterned writing techniques. However, the use of the phrase, the Lord has sworn, in Psalm 110 verse 4 appears only once in all of the Psalms. In fact, this phrase only appears uniquely in two other Old Testament documents, one attributed to Isaiah and the other to Amos. The fourth appearance of this phrase within all of the canonized Holy Bibles in the New Testament epistle to the Hebrews but it is a quote of Psalm 110 verse 4. Some examples of repeated phrases appearing in the Psalms without specific citations are, quote, praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, bless the Lord, the Lord reigns, and sing to the Lord, quote. There are variants of these phrases and similar phrases repeated by David as an obvious pattern in this writing technique. The uniqueness of the Lord has sworn is an indication that David might not have been the author of Psalm 110 because it does not appear as a song pattern in any other psalm. But the phrase is not so unique that another prophet has never used it. Isaiah's use of the phrase may explain the modern day understanding of the phrase as it becomes the standard concept for swearing in a witness in a court of law by having the person raise his or her right hand and swear or affirm an oath to tell the truth. And the meaning of the word sworn is synonymous with making a promise in the context as it appears in both Amos and Isaiah. The unknown author of the epistle to the Hebrews in the New Testament implies the same meaning when misquoting Psalm 110 in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 21. One of the evidences of pagan fraud and heretical alterations to the text of documents canonized in the Holy Bible is the intentional misquotation of material by altering a specific detail to create an alternate meaning. In the Lamsa English translation of the ancient Eastern text from the Aramaic Peshitta, Psalm 110 says, the Lord is sworn and will not lie. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. From the same source, Hebrews 7.21 says, 
for they were made priests without oaths. But this one was made a priest with an oath, as it was said concerning him by David, The Lord has sworn and will not lie. Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In both passages, there are three specific tricks of psycholinguistic manipulation. There is the use of pronouns without a clear antecedent, there is the faulty use of capitalization, and there is the intentionally faulty use of punctuation. Well, that is all the time that we have for this segment. Be sure to subscribe for notifications of new releases. As always, thank you for listening. I am Michael.